you know, I, I've been saying um, when I talk to white Christians, like I, I really wish white Christians would stop talking about reconciliation, just stop talking about it altogether. Um, because here's the thing, if white Christians stop talking about reconciliation and they just started talking about repairing the damage uh, and uh, making restitution in order to make things right, reconciliation would come as an outgrowth of that work. An ordained minister has decided to give up God for a year. How the heck do you just up and become atheist after being a pastor? What I'm most worried about right now is figuring out how I can live openly and honestly. I am finally free to be me. I have no idea how to find friends or become a part of a community that's not religious. What does life look like after church, after religion, after God? That's, you know, that, that's it in a nutshell. This is the Life After God podcast, a conversation on the space between belief and unbelief and beyond with your host, Ryan Bell. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Life After God podcast. My name is Ryan Bell, and I'm your host. This is episode 91. My guest today is Robert P. Jones, founder and CEO of Public Religion Research Institute. PRRI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. Robbie Jones' new book is White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Talk about timely. I hope everyone will read this book, uh, especially Christians, especially white Christians, but truly anyone. It, the, the information that he conveys, both the theological work that he did, as well as the research that he's conducted to determine uh, the sort of racist quotient, if you will, uh, of all of us is really, really interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. I've also been reading Eddie Gloud's new book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. I've been on a little James Baldwin binge lately, and I want to say that if you haven't seen I Am Not Your Negro, it's on Netflix right now and truly remarkable. Before too long, I'm going to speak with a friend and professor at Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles about our late brother, Jimmy Baldwin. So we have that to look forward to. I'm also going to be speaking with my friend, Jamie Lombardi, about Albert Camus. So lots of good stuff in the works. Jamie and I had a live conversation with Greg Epstein, my guest on the previous episode, a few months back about the plague. And ever since, I've been wanting to get Jamie on the show to talk about the incredible insights that Camus has for our present moment. She's a bit obsessed, and I think she would agree with that assessment. One more thing uh, with reference to my conversation today with Robbie Jones. There was an excellent piece in the New York Times about a week ago called Christianity Will Have Power. Perhaps you saw it and read it, uh, and if you haven't, I'll put a link in the show notes so that you can find it and check it out. It's a perfect companion piece to Robbie's book and our conversation. So I just want to read uh, a portion of that uh, article to you. I think it really perfectly sets the stage for uh, what Robbie and I are going to talk about and the content of his book. It's an interview or, or a conversation with some Christians from Sioux Center, Iowa, uh, about their relationship to Christianity, to Donald Trump, why they support him, and what it is they fear the most about America. And it's a little window into a world that I think many of us don't see very often, and we sort of scratch our heads about how evangelicals could possibly support Donald Trump. And uh, I think this is highly relevant and sort of sets a, a narrative picture uh, for, uh, for my conversation with Robbie. So here's a, a sort of an extended uh, reading from that article. On a Sunday in March, Mr. Shouten worshipped at United Reformed Church with neighbors he has known for years. They all knew the harmonies by heart. They were one choir in sync on yellow quilted pews. They sang, I will praise my dear Redeemer, his triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell. They prayed, With our God we shall be valiant, he will vanquish all our foes. The pastor spoke to a sea of white parishioners, God's standard requires absolute, total, perfect obedience. The Shouten's oldest daughter, who was 11, took careful notes in her journal. When the service ended, the church served cookies. 
Mr. Shouten caught up with some friends, all fathers in their 30s, wearing blue collared shirts and khaki pants. Trump's an outsider, like the rest of us, he said. We might not respect Trump, but we still love the guy for who he is. Is he a man of integrity? Absolutely not, he went on. Does he stand up for some of our moral Christian values? Yes. The guys agreed. I'm not going to say he's a Christian, but he just doesn't attack us, his friend Jason Mulder said. Mr. Shouten's wife, Karen, had walked over with the other wives. After the election of President Barack Obama, the country seemed to undergo a cultural shift, she said. It was dangerous to voice your Christianity, she said, because we were viewed as bigots, as racists. We were labeled as the haters and the ones who are causing all the derision and all the problems in America. Blame it on the white believers. None of them said they had wanted to vote for Mr. Trump, but they did. When he was the last option, Heather Hugendorn said. The group laughed. But they agreed it would be easier to vote for him this time. Before, it was hard to know what he would be like as president. Now they knew, and they liked the results. Supreme Court justices, conservative judges, including a Dort graduate now on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, and growing clout for the anti-abortion movement. Obama wanted to take my assault rifle. He wanted to take out all the high-capacity magazines, Mr. Shouten said. It just felt like your freedoms kept getting taken from you, said Heather's husband, Paul, finishing the sentence for him. When the Shoutons got home, Karen, 36, scooped a chip into the sour cream dip and plopped into a chair in her living room. She spoke of her concerns about sex trafficking. She had seen posts on Facebook about mothers being followed to their cars if they went shopping at Target in Sioux City, almost an hour away. I'm safe when I'm here. I'm not afraid when I'm here, she said. They thought about the lives they want for their children and why they send them to Christian elementary school. We hope our kids eventually find a Christian spouse, and that exposes them to other kids of like-mindedness, her husband said. The two of them met through their rival Christian high schools. People seem to get married younger around here than they do in corporate America, Mr. Shouten said. It's fairly common for women to go to Dort to get their MRS degree, their Mrs. degree, he said. When she was younger, his wife said, she used to say she would leave Sioux County. She remembered the shock of traveling to Europe in high school and seeing, quote, men in full drag for the first time. We have life very easy. It is laid back. It is like-minded people. And it's just, I like the bubble, she said. I like not worrying about sending them outside to play or whose house they are going to if they are going to the neighbors a few houses down. They might not go to the same church. They might not hold all the same beliefs. But I trust them. I don't know, maybe that's naive. I'll put the link to the rest of the article in the show notes uh, so that you can uh, read the whole thing. I think it's super interesting and insightful. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of listeners who contribute anywhere from $1 to $100 a month to make it possible. So I want to say a hearty thank you to each one of you. I want to especially thank the newest members to join since the last episode, Rick, Ray, Dan, and my good friend Samir. Thank you all so much for helping me keep the show going, especially now during these challenging times. If you've been appreciating the podcast, I first want to say thank you for tuning in, even if just sporadically. That's the whole reason I do this, so that you can hear and engage with the conversation. I would be so grateful if you became a supporter. Membership starts at $5 a month, and if you want to join this group of super smart people who support the show, please visit patreon.com slash lifeaftergod. It would also be awesome if you would subscribe to the podcast on whatever app you use and leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others to be able to find the show. Okay, enough about all of that. Let's get into this conversation with Robbie Jones. Robert P. Jones, welcome to the Life After God podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so uh, so good to talk to you. i um, been a fan of your work for a long time. And uh, you have this new book out, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And it's been a fascinating read. It's only been out, what, a week or two? A week, yes. Hot off the press. Wow. Yeah, it's so fantastic. And something I think that we have sorely needed in the dialogue around religion and race Um and before we dive in, I know it's it's interesting, and a lot of commentators, a lot of reviewers have pointed out that it's sort of a combination of memoir and social science, which is your expertise, um, and history. 
but I, I kind of, as I often do with this show, start with the autobiography part and just tell us a little bit about sure. your background that kind of sets up why this is so important for you. Yeah, well, I grew up uh, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi and in Texas, uh, but grew up in a Southern Baptist uh, family uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm white. Uh, so kind of grew up in the white evangelical uh, world. And, you know, I was that kid who was at church five times a week growing up, even all through my uh, adolescent years, active in the youth group. I went to a Southern Baptist college, Mississippi College. Um, I have a Master of Divinity degree, went to seminary um, at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Um, so, you know, drank very deeply at this well um, of kind of just the Southern Baptist and white evangelical world. Um, and, you know, my family roots go back quite deep um, in the South, um, six generations back, uh, and in fact, in middle Georgia and in Bibb County, Twiggs County, Georgia, right around Macon. Uh, they are some both on both sides of my family. So, you know, this story of white Christianity and particularly in my case of white evangelical Christianity is, you know, literally in my, in my, in my blood. Mm. Did you start to see signs when you were in seminary that there was something troubling you about sort of the moral incongruence of, of your sort of re- religious upbringing and what you were learning in, in seminary or when, when did the cracks right. start to appear? Well, you know, I mean, this is the, I think, astonishing thing, you know, from where I am looking back. So I'm, I'm 52 years old, born in 1968. Um, and so I was in elementary school in the 1970s. And, you know, I, when I think back, I remember, for example, uh, the first African-American kids showing up at, at my elementary school. So Mississippi drug its feet um, and, and managed to not actually integrate uh, the public schools that I was a part of until uh, 20 years after Brown v. Board of Education, right, in the mid-1950s. Mm. Um, and, you know, so I remember that. But, you know, the thing was, it it wasn't something that I, I thought that much about. And I think as, you know, someone who's white had the luxury of not thinking about it that much. I mean, I wasn't the person being, you know, put on a bus and taken across town, uh, you know, to a predominantly uh, uh, African American school, it was it was the other way around in my, in my neighborhood that the African American kids were uh, being put on buses and taken over to you know our uh, entirely white uh, you know uh, working class neighborhood on the south side of Jackson. Um, so it it you know it it wasn't something I thought about that much, um, and, and I think that's the thing is that growing up, um, and th- I think it speaks to the power of the way that my white Christian world and worldview. Uh, really blinded, has created this moral blind spot um, where issues of racial justice, racial inequality, um, just never quite penetrated. Um, it, it's it's quite extraordinary, really thinking back on it, and that includes you know the high school I went to. I, I went to a public high school. It was again integrated, about 50, 50 white and black. Um, but our high school mascot had been re- had been renamed. Uh, the rebels in the 1940s. Wow. Um, and, and, and we, you know, we had Colonel Reb as the mascot, a, a Confederate Colonel as the mascot. Um, our band played Dixie when the, um, when the football team uh, scored a touchdown and a white cheerleader ran up and down the sidelines with the rebel flag. And even that, right, that overt, all these overt Confederate symbols were not really something that ever really got interrogated by me or most of my friends or, and certainly by not by our churches um, growing up. So it really wasn't until I was in my twenties in, in seminary that I, that I even learned, for example, the origin story of my home denomination, the Southern Baptist uh, convention, which was explicitly formed uh, to create a version of Christianity that was perfectly compatible with slaveholding. Yeah, it's really remarkable. And one of the things that I, I notice uh, about, your book and other things I've been reading over the last several years is this history that, that I just didn't learn. I'm only about two years Mm younger, about two years younger than you. And so, you know, I grew up in the Midwest though. I wasn't raised in the South and, but it's not, wasn't that different for me. I was in the United Methodist church and then my folks became seventh day Adventists and uh, spent the, you know, the vast majority of my life in the seventh day Adventist church until a few years ago um and and this history whether it's uh you know the the Harlem Renaissance civil rights the complexity of civil rights movement like you know we learned about Martin Luther King Jr and this kind of whitewashed version about 
not judging a person by the color of their skin, mm-hmm. but you never really understood, uh, and certainly not the latter years of King, where he becomes much more like tuned in and aware in his own sense of the interrelationship between militarism and economics and racism mm-hmm. and poverty. All this is taken out. Like it, it was, I was a, somehow I got through school and never learned this history. And I'm now at the age in my late forties learning it. Um, I suppose that was your experience as well. Yeah, I, that's, that's exactly right. And you know, the uh, you, that's right. You hear these little snippets, you know, from Martin Luther King um, but what you, you didn't hit, I mean, again, I was in my twenties before I ever read letter from Birmingham jail, right. You know, wh- where he's actually, I mean, that's where he's calling out, uh, uh, not just the kind of rabid, you know, uh, KKK and, and, ra- uh, you know, overtly, um, like violent racist, but he's calling out the good moderate right. white Christians, right. And saying like, where are you? Why aren't you showing up, you know, in this movement for equality, and justice, and he has this um, line in there that I that I think kind of goes to what we're talking about, you know, where where he is this, this fantastic image um, that I think is so accurate. He he says, you know, he he imagines um, white Christians sitting comfortably uh, behind the anesthetizing effect of their stained glass windows, wow, you know, and yeah. and that it just that that the way that church was constructed, the way that theology was constructed, really did more to soothe and um, really anesthetize the consciences of, mm. of white Christians more than it did to sharpen their sensitivity um, to the claims of racial injustice all, all around us. You, you start the book with such a bang. It's, if ever anybody is worried about you know, a nonfiction book not being as engaging as a novel or not drawing you in right away, let me, let me just read this sentence from page six. <laughs> it says, white Christian churches have not just been complacent, They have not only been complicit, rather as the dominant cultural power in America, they have been responsible for constructing and sustaining a project to protect white supremacy and resist black equality. This project has framed the entire American story. I mean, that's a hell of a claim. Um, (laughs) I mean, I I think some Christians would admit to being complacent. Yeah, you know, the church hasn't done all it could do to combat racism all the way up until, you know, right this minute. But to say that it was constructed on purpose to protect white supremacy, say a bit more about that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I did try, um, I think because um, of how powerful uh, that anesthetizing effect has been historically, I did try very hard, um, one, to not flinch myself from what the history and the current public opinion data seem to be clearly, you know, the truth that, that those sources uh, were testifying to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, for myself, and then I tried to, as, as best I could, to put it on the page, um, you know, without really sugarcoating it, without flinching, uh, because I think without it being that powerful, it's so easily dismissed um, just because that's what white Christians have done for most of American history. And, you know, I think it has been blamed on, um, you know, well, it's just Southern culture, right? It really wasn't Christianity. There's been a kind of protectionist um, realm uh, or a protectionist strategy of protecting Christianity from being caught up, you know, in anything that really, um, you know, has teeth teeth to it. It, It's incidental. It's really the culture. Um, But, you know, there's really, you know, if, if you, I think if you read the history and you really take it in. And if you look at public opinion t- uh, today, you can see that you can see the legacy uh, of this. And, and, you know, one of the images I use, I really think that uh, if you think about this as kind of an organic way uh, that, that one of the things has happened is that by decision after decision, uh, decade over decade for hundreds of years, white Christians have built uh, literally built uh, into the DNA of white Christianity an a priori commitment to white supremacy. Um, and, and there's just really, you know, my, my reading of history, there's no other way to, to really say it, uh, but that, and, and I think the, the objections many white Christians might have is like, wait a minute, you know, um, we aren't all members of the KKK or you right. know, that kind of thing, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I really am talking about if you take the meaning of white supremacy literally, and you kind of unpack it a bit, 
you know, and even if you slip the words around um, uh, instead of white supremacy, saying this uh, belief in the supremacy of whites or another way of saying it uh, in even plainer language is really to think about it as a commitment to setting up and protecting um, a, a society that that's set up to value the lives of white people over the val over the lives of others. And I think if you look at the way, you know, housing policy has been set up, uh, jobs and opportunities have been set up, who was uh, able to vote, who was restricted from voting. I mean, that it is just an undeniable history of a society that was set up to privilege um, and give white Americans more opportunities and value their life outcomes more um, than, than African-Americans and other people, people of color. Uh, so if we take that seriously, then I think we've got some, you know, some serious interrogation to do. But you know, just opening that door, though, um, I think is is hopefully one of the things that um, that the book will help white Christians do. Um, and even for those who aren't white and Christian, I, I'm, I think, you know, it will uh, hopefully the book will help explain how we got to where we are and like why our politics look the way they do, particularly around uh, racial justice issues. So you're a researcher and a public opinion poller, you're the founder of uh, and the president of um, Public Religion Research Institute. So this is your, that's your day job. That's what you do every single yeah. day. So, you know, I can imagine if you just walk up to, you know, a hundred white Christians and say, do you value the lives of white people over the lives of others? They're going to say, well, no, of course not. But right. but there's other ways of finding out. How how did you go about ascertaining whether this was actually true, uh, as a, as a matter of fact? Yeah, you know it is tricky right, with public opinion research. You're exactly right. I mean, you you can't um, really ask someone straight up, well, do you consider yourself a racist or not? I mean, you you <laughs> kind of know what you'll get from those uh, sorts of questions, and nothing very helpful. Um, and, you know, and, and we see this in some public opinion data, for example, um, you know, if you just ask people how a common way of asking some of these questions is how warmly do you feel toward the following, you know, people groups and you ask about African-Americans or Jews or Catholics or, you know, and, and you go through a battery like that. Um, but we, we actually have found that those are also aren't that helpful. Um, right. Just like on immigration, for example, uh, people can hold uh, quite warm views toward immigrants or Latinos and at the same time hold quite harsh views about what policies, you know, favor building the wall, favor deporting uh, people, favor separating children from their families, and, and those things can exist um, simultaneously. So on the issue of race, what, um, uh, you know, after a lot of, uh, I looked at some of the social science data built on a, some, some literature that has been measuring, um, it's often called symbolic racism or um, uh, racial resentment measures um, in the, in the literature, but built it out a, a little more so that it was measuring, you know, not just um, personal attitudes toward uh, other uh, black people, um, but was measuring uh, structure. Try to get at measuring structural uh, injustice and structural racism. So, uh, what I did in the book is I put together this thing called um, that I called a racism index, um, and it is a measure. It's a composite measure that builds up. Uh, from 15 different questions uh, that are designed to get, you know, really beyond these personal biases and, and really, again, to get at um, structural racism. So um, they cover a fair amount of ground, which I think is also good. They're not just kind of one kind of one vector of, of thought. So they, they cover basically four areas. Um, one is um, several questions about um, attitudes around Confederate symbols, such as like whether they are uh, symbols of just symbols of Southern pride or whether they are symbols of racism. Mm. Uh, questions about um, African American economic mobility uh, and whether past discrimination, for example, limits uh, current upward mobility among African Americans. Whether there's a legacy, whether people perceive there to be a connection between those things or not. Um, the treatment of African. The third one is the treatment of African Americans in the criminal justice system. Whether that's about sentencing, mass incarceration, um, or um, the killing of African American men by police. Uh, and then finally a set of questions around race, just general questions around racism and, and racial discrimination in the country uh, today. What, it turns out that these 15 questions um, actually worked, scale together quite well. Um, they're, they're highly, highly correlated. So uh, what that tells me is they're measuring a kind of latent uh, set of, you know, attitude that's kind of behind each of these individual questions. 
And that's really what I use to kind of look at the patterns um, uh, between kind of white Christians on the one hand uh, and whites who are religiously unaffiliated on the other. And I think that's really where you see the gap and where you see the work that um, Christianity is, is really doing uh, here. If you look at the gap between white Christians and, and whites who are unaffiliated. Uh, so just to kind of wrap this this up, like one way of thinking about this is um, that racism index, we scored on a scale of, of one to 10. Um, and um, if you look at uh, with, with 10 being holding more racist attitudes and one being hold, holding fewer racist attitudes um, across those 15 questions. So white evangelical Protestants, um, again, the group that's more prominent in the South, um, uh, where our group score, they score basically eight out of 10 um, on that on that racism index. Uh, but here's the, maybe the surprise is that, you know, you, you said you grew up in, in the Midwest. Mm. Uh, the white mainline Protestant group, um, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, which tend to be thought of as the more liberal end of the white Protestant world, score seven out of 10 um, mm. on this scale. Um, and white Catholics, right, who are more urban, who have their own history of being discriminated against, um, you know, the anti-Catholic sentiment um, as well. They also score seven out of 10 um, on this racism index. And if you compare that to religiously unaffiliated whites, um, uh, those who claim no religious affiliation, they only score four out of 10. Uh, and African-American Protestants themselves score two out of 10, just to give you huh. some perspective. And and, 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 I, and when you see that survey after survey, uh, question after question, and it really is the combination of the history um, and this, how you see this legacy still um, across these questions in current public opinion data um, that, uh, that I think is, is really what, what is most powerful and really shows us the reality of how these, these attitudes are still very much with us today. Hmm. Yeah. And I think the thing that it was even more striking to me than the seven to eight out of 10 for white Christians, um, was the degree to which if you knew a person was, and I'm going to say this wrong cause I'm definitely not a statistician. If you knew a person was a white Christian, you could be reasonably certain that they were about 20% more likely to be racist. Do I have that right? Or like, uh, close. Or that it increased um, their, yeah, yeah, help me, help me. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, in, in the book, I, I tried to, to um, so the data I've just described is, is about correlations, right? So there's clearly a, a strong correlation between holding more racist attitudes and identifying as a white Christian. But there's usually two objections that are raised when, you know, uh, by folks, if you're just looking at correlation, and one is, well, look, maybe it's just because white Christians are more Republican, or maybe it's because they're less likely to have a college degree or more likely to live in the South and the Midwest or in rural areas. Um, yeah. And so one, one of the things I did in the book was actually tested, you know, for these alternative explanations. And the way you do that statistically is you put uh, these things in a statistical model and, and you introduce controls for being Republican and age and gender and uh, region and all of these things I've just talked about. And even with all those controls in place, which essentially is testing for these as alternative explanations between these this, um, the correlations, um, it turns out that this relationship between holding more racist attitudes and identifying as a white Christian. And again, I'm not just talking about evangelicals, right. but also mainline Protestants and white Catholics. Um, stands up as an independent, uh, uh, independent uh, relationship, um, e even holding all these other variables constant. Um, and the other uh, objection that I think is often raised is, okay, well, look, maybe this is just uh, people claiming to be Christian, but they don't really go to church, right? So, <laughs> right. The, so maybe, the, so maybe the data is muddied because these are people who just claim to be Christian, but really haven't been formed by any you know, haven't been discipled to use the re religious turn, haven't, you know, participated in a Christian community. Um, so I tested for that too. Um, and it turns out that there's really no evidence in the data that attending church makes a white Christian less racist. Um, and in, in, in fact, exactly. you know, the, the correlations are positive among both low attending and high attending hmm. um, white Christians. And if you look among white evangelicals, um, um, the opposite is actually true. That is that the relationship between holding racist attitudes and identifying as a white evangelical, that relationship is actually stronger among those who attend more frequently uh, than among those who attend less frequently. And then, you know, the, and then what the, the piece you were talking about, I also flipped it around to see. So that was like um, looking at the relationship between holding racist attitudes and identifying as white Christian. I actually flipped it around to see if the relationship worked the other way. That is, um, 
uh, if you identify as a white Christian, how much more likely are you to hold racist attitudes or kind of just flip it and look at it the other direction? Mm. And, and that's where I found that um, being affiliated with any particular white Christian group, whether it's white mainline, white evangelical, white Catholic, um, resulted in, a, in an approximately 10 percent increase in holding racist attitudes. And again, that's with all kinds of controls in there to control for these alternative explanations. But but white Christian identity alone um, accounts uh, for about a 10 percent increase in holding racist attitudes. Wow. And is this this still wouldn't be considered causation like it doesn't mean or or does it? You know, it, it's uh, it's it's kind of one step shy of causation, but but these what you the way that, to really think about this is that there is an independent and positive relationship mm. um, the, uh, between holding racist attitudes and identifying as a white Christian, and the reverse is true. There's an independent positive relationship between identifying as a right, white Christian and holding uh, more racist attitudes. You talk a lot um, in the first part of the book uh, toward the beginning is a chapter on beliefs and theology. Um, and, you know, I, I've, this is where I'm more familiar, you know, having, I also have an MDiv and was a pastor for a number of years yeah. and really saw the way that evangelical and, and, and honestly, I, I really appreciate the way that your work highlights the fact that there's not a lot of difference here between uh, mainline and Catholic and evangelical, like they're all pretty much in the same boat, and the theology isn't so different when it comes right down to it. In other words, a belief in salvation through that everyone needs to be saved through a personal relationship with Jesus, who will forgive all of your sins and make you um, eligible for eternal life, or not eligible, but you'll have eternal life. And yeah. Um, and I mean, I remember back, you know, when I was about halfway through my pastoral career, reading some books about the way that this had, you know, the problem with this individualized gospel and, yeah. and the gospel as a sin management, sort of sin management system. And um, and even my denom- my troubles with the denomination that led to my eventual departure from the church was around, you know, too much social justice activism that I wasn't really... Um, you know, living out the gospel, which was to teach yeah. teach people that they needed to be saved and come and join the church. Um, wh- what would, what did you you know, based on your own theological training as well as your um, research training, how, how do you re- see this relationship between theology and the results that you're finding? Right. I mean, you know, so I did try to uh, dust off my MDiv degree <laughs> for that chat, for that chapter and. Um, and really, you know, do some theological spade work. And, and, and part of that was also, um, you know, personal for me is kind of thinking back through and say, okay, so this theological worldview that I was raised with, trained in seminary with, what is it about that um, that is functioning uh, really as, a, as a, a, a filter that filters out strong claims to social justice? Um, and, and it is this hyper, you know, I, I do think it's this hyper individualized there's a number of components to it, but the one I think is the most powerful is this hyper individualized uh, understanding of salvation. So that the beginning and the end of authentic religion is confined to this interior space, right? right? This, this, this relationship, this kind of um, emotive and um, kind of cognitive relationship with Jesus. So it, it's about prayer um, and, and about this kind of one-on-one sense of being connected uh, to Jesus. Again, this is the beginning and the end of, of religion. Um, and so it means that if, if that's what it means to be authentically religious, um, there's little toehold toe for uh, claims to what white Christians should be doing to, to work for the equality of African Americans um, in society. Um, and uh, it, 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 particularly when you already have a society that is set up Um, you know, with, again, an a priori commitment to valuing the lives of whites over the lives of others through our laws and through our, the way our, you know, neighborhoods are set up, et cetera, et cetera. When that's already in place, um, all you need to do, right, is to kind of protect the status quo. And and I I think the troubling conclusion I came to is that that's really what uh, most of white Christian theology has has been about at the, at the at its beginning, and this and the way that this personal relationship with Jesus functions 
is to really protect white consciences. Again, um, going back to King, mm. um, it, it's, it creates this blind spot where you can simultaneously be numb, uh, unaware uh, at best, um, you know, uh, and, and feel like you're still in the right place um, religiously and, and as a Christian. And be totally um, and, justified in, in your yeah, life. Without being troubled, um, no trouble in the soul, um, you know, uh, yeah, that's right. Feeling pretty, you know, frankly, um, you know, not just comfortable, but, but smug, yeah. um, about, about where, uh, about where you are. And, and it just doesn't leave a lot of, um, uh, theological space, um, for these other claims to come in and to challenge, you know, really what it means to be, you know, white and Christian. And so when you've got, like, I just think back to, you know, Mississippi, uh, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, like Governor Ross Barnett, for example, like one of the most vehement segregationists, you know, uh, governors in, in, in the state of Mississippi, and that's saying a lot, um, <laughs> was all w- was also the head of the men's Sunday school uh, department at First Baptist Church in Jackson, a like widely respected, you know, Sunday school teacher. And he he could hold that spot at this this at the largest and most powerful church, white Christian church in, in the whole state. And he could say things in public like God was the original segregationist, you know, without flinching. Yeah. Um, and, and that there was no put, there was no blowback. There was no pushback that, that was seen to be, um, perfectly compatible with his holding a, uh, you know, a tight personal relationship with Jesus and being a Christian in good standing at the most respected church in the entire state. I think this sense of individualism, I mean, it does seem like Americanism and and Christianity are are so well married to each other, and I guess they both sort of grew up together, you know, America and this kind of Christianity that you're describing, which does really cross denominational bounds. Um, I mean, going back to to Max Weber, even thinking about like the Protestant work ethic and the sense in which individualism was baked into the founding of our nation, but also the you know the version of Christianity that evolves here in America. And, and I feel like it, it it's I see it manifest in people who who don't go to church as well or who claim to be Christian. Um and and I and I think some of the critique we're seeing right now of some anti racism uh work. So so I, I guess I mean like some of the people that are working on anti racism stuff tend to focus on getting your head right about racism. And and again, it's almost like absolving whites of their responsibility to actually change something in society rather than just feel sorry for something mm-hmm. and ask for forgiveness from people or to, to feel really bad about it. Like if I just feel really bad about it and try not to have those feelings anymore. So, you know, if I'm jogging and it's late, you know, at night and I see someone approaching me who's, who's black, you know, and I have this feeling like I might be in danger more so than if it was a white person, you know, I got to try to, you know, excise that from my mind, which I think is really important work and everybody should be aware of those tendencies and try to fix those things in their thinking but it ultimately doesn't change anything for communities of color unless we make structural changes. And I, I feel like this this Christianity has seeped into the groundwater of America. And I wonder, are you, you? But you did see in your research that people who are not religiously affiliated don't correlate as highly to racist attitudes. So, do you see some change yeah. happening for people as they leave religion? Well, certainly, one thing you could say is that. Um, like white Americans who do not, who are not Christian, um, have an easier time seeing structural racism than whites who are Christian. Mm, I mean, that's, that's really just well so, it, yeah. so crystal clear, um, in the data. And, and it is because I think whites have been conditioned by their theology, um, uh, that, that again, by design, right. Was protecting, uh, this, this place of, you know, privilege and power at the top of the, of the social, cultural, and political pyramid um, that, that white Christians occupied. Um, so, you know, it's, again, it's built in and built in kind of by design to protect the status quo. Um, and and, and it's, it is remarkable, though, that, that, that whites who are unaffiliated, you know, can seem to be able to see this much, seem to be able to see these structural injustices uh, much easier. But I, but I think you're right about this formula. I write about this toward the end of the book, um, that 
even well-meaning white Christians, I think often reach for a kind of shortcut here. And, and the formula tends to be like white apology and lament, mm. right? So saying I'm sorry and feeling bad about it, um, plus black forgiveness equals reconciliation. Like that's that's the shortcut formula. Yeah. Um, now what, what completely drops out of that, of course, is any conversation about repair, repairing the damage, uh, making restitution, setting things right, and so, you know, if you're if you're a white Christian, um, that's a pretty good deal, right? If you can just move from saying I'm sorry to reconciliation without a lot changing. Yeah. Um, and in fact, and in fact, we see in um, you know we've seen this kind of played out and sometimes in like quite dramatic fashion. Um, so you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, for example, finally got around to apologizing for slavery in 1995 um, uh, at at uh, the 150th anniversary of the founding of the denomination. <laughs> and, and, and when they did that, um, it was notable how they, how they orchestrated it. So they, they had a resolution that was, you know, that had, you know, sincere, you know, apology admission to their role and supporting slavery and blessing slavery, declaring it, you know, compatible with Christian teaching, all of that's there. Um, and so they vote overwhelmingly to uh, uh, have this be the official position of the convention and but then they had um, uh, orchestrated an African American uh, pastor um, who was also a member of the SBC to come up to the podium, and immediately um, uh, said, uh, "I accept this apology on behalf of my African American brothers and sisters," um, and 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 the place erupted into uh, you know uh, raucous applause. Right. So yeah, you had a hun- and and that whole thing. Uh, there was almost no debate on it. That that entire set of events I just described took about fifteen minutes. Um, so you Fixed so you've it. got a hundred and hundred and fifty years plus, you know, of um, denial, support for segregation, support for slavery, that seemingly gets swept away in fifteen minutes of you know what you can really only call uh, theater, right? A, a kind of a theological theater, um, and, and there's very little conversation after that about. So, okay, so what do we owe whom? Um, what kind of da- so we did all this damage? Um, what's our responsibility now? I mean, those questions largely went nowhere um, among you know, and and I think that that's the thing is so I, you know I I've been saying um, when I talk to white Christians like I, I really wish white Christians would stop talking about reconciliation, hmm. just stop talking about it altogether, um, because here's the thing: if white Christians stop talking about reconciliation and they just started talking about repairing the damage uh, and uh, making restitution in order to make things right, reconciliation would come as an outgrowth of that work. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, very naturally and very organically. White Christians really ought to wait for African Americans to tell them when they're reconciled yeah. after they've done the after they've done the work. Well that's such such good words. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I wanted to mention I, I just as we were talking this I remembered this tweet that I saw from a few days ago um, from Ryan Burge about the um, the CCES data from 2018, and he he has this. Um, I don't know. It's not him, but the 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 work I guess that he's a part of. It shows a racial resentment. Um, this is one disadvantage of doing radio and not video. <laughs> um, You're holding up a chart right now? Yeah. Can you see what I'm looking at here? Um, there's a, a chart, a racial resentment by religious tradition and ideology. And um, it's a racial resentment scale that goes from zero to three at this on this scale. And then um, it has very liberal, liberal, moderate, conservative, and very conservative across the bottom. And then each of those categories has five bars that correspond to agnostics, atheists, Catholics, evangelicals, and nothing in particular. Mm. And it sh- he shows in this that on, on conservative and very conservative, the highest racial resentment is among agnostics and atheists. <laughs> or, or actually the very conservative, it's evangelicals, by, uh, but still agnostics look higher. And then as you go down the scale... Um, to very liberal and liberal um, agnostics and atheists are much less racially resentful. So anyway, I know that's hard to, 
Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think I'm following it. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm what, well, you know, you said you were, and I know this is kind of jumping around. This goes back to an earlier thing we were talking about, about controlling for other factors. But um, what do you, did you have any comment on like how, cause you know, I'm now a part of the atheist and secular mm-hmm. community and, and we see a kind of um, resurgence of, of, white supremacy among among some skeptics and atheists as well you know it, it's true there is some some of that going on i, I think particularly among the atheists and, and even some of the um kind of atheist authors um that you know kind of are at the vanguard of the movement um, for example i mean there was a fair amount of anti-muslim sentiment right um you know that had that came out um uh there as well so you know I, I I wouldn't want to say at all that um, among white unaffiliated Americans, all is well and all is good. Um, For example, you know, their scores on the racism index that I have in the book is still twice as high um, as African-American. Right. uh, Right. For example. Right. You know, they're they're not quite right there. Um, But but I but there still is such a chasm between uh, the unaffiliated whites who are unaffiliated and whites who are Christian that's the that's the big pattern, right? Yeah. So I, I still think that is the big pattern that right. really stands up, um, and is and is really the most um, uh, I think noteworthy thing. The other thing to say is to the the um, uh, I don't have that data right in front of me, but um, you know the atheist, agnostic, and nothing in particular crowd, uh, which is the three subgroups inside this group that often gets lumped to- together mm. a- as the unaffiliated, right? Um, uh, that group does lean pretty hard left. So when you look at things like among conservatives, the people who are atheist agnostic, nothing in particular, um, those groups are actually fairly small. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Right? The data it, set's pretty small there. Well, well, even the, I'm just saying that because the group leans liberal, um, when you filter out just the conservatives in that group, it's a fairly small slice gotcha. of, of the unaffiliated because most of them lean left. It's, it's sort of like trying to analyze um, liberal Republicans. Mm, right. Mm. Um, like there's not that many of them. They they exist. Um, you can look at them and they look different than other Republicans. But as a proportion of Republicans, they're very, very small. Right. Um, right. So that, that, that'd be my only caveat. Uh, yeah. With the, other, with the other data. Yeah, that's really helpful. Well, I want to sort of approach the conclusion of this by asking you again about your, you know, yourself, like how has all of this um, well, ask you about yourself and then about the rest of us. Um, how has this affected you personally learning about all of this over the years? And when, where do you currently stand with relationship to religion in your own life? Mm. If that's not too personal of a question. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, well, you know, look, it's, it's been a, I think it's been a heavy and, and tough book to write. Um, you know, and I've been working on the book for uh, over two years now started, um, you know, uh, kind of early 2018. Um, uh, and, and so, and, you know, and thinking about it even further back than that, but working on the book in, in earnest, you know, for, for over two years. Um, so it's, it's been a, it's been a journey. And so, I mean, even again, I, I think, sir, you know, I have a PhD in religion, I have an MDiv degree and the amount of the, this history, um, that is in the book, that I would not have known even two years ago is astonishing hmm, right, to me. Hmm, hmm. Um, and, and so I, I think that journey has been really important um, for, for kind of like I had some hunches, knew a few things, but you know um, it, it's just like every, you know, sort of every stone you turn over, you're like, Oh, well there's more, uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's been, it's been that kind of feeling and, and a feeling kind of, honestly, um, as someone who's raised in the church and um, you know, and obviously, uh, still care about, uh, you know, Christianity, I wouldn't have taken the trouble to write the book, but, um, it, it, it is, it's been unsettling really to me personally, um, how much I did not know. Um, you know, I knew a little bit, um, and, and really it's not like I had to dig through, uh, you know, I mean, I did some, you know, primary research, but a lot of it's just right out. It's out there. Right. I mean, it's just under the, it's just under the surface. It's just that it's been so repressed. And, and I do think white Christianity, um, has has really largely escaped scrutiny um, on this front, and and you know I think that's that's not good for the country. Um, I, it, it's certainly not good for relationships between Black and White Americans, and the truth is it's not healthy or good for White Christianity itself to escape right. you know this this scrutiny about it, its own its own past. Um, so you know I I think what I've been just buoyed by is just trying my best to tell the truth, 
um, you know, both for myself um, and for uh, readers, you know, who'll read the book. Um, so my, my own, uh, so I, you know, I uh, kind of left the Southern Baptist fold after seminary, um, attended uh, some Baptist churches uh, for a while during graduate school, you know, through my 30s. Um, and then um, a- a more recently have uh, attended interfaith congregation here in uh, here in D.C. Um, so, you know, I still broadly consider myself, um, you know, Protestant and Christian. Um, I don't really have a denominational uh, tie, but but I, you know, I do think this is still very much um uh, a story I'm a part of, you know, and, and sort of trying to, I think, do my part to, um, you know, I think cast a little bit of light, um, uh, on a, on a path that I, I think it particularly, you know, it's long past time, you know, for this conversation. I think that's the other thing I'll say in closing is, is um, we've had so many opportunities and we, I mean, white Christians here in particular, um, to do the right thing and to tell the truth. Um, and we have very clearly failed, um, you know, at, at those moments, we, we had an opportunity at, in the civil war at the end of the civil war during reconstruction, uh, to tell the truth. We had an opportunity, um, you know, through the Jim Crow era to stand up and tell the truth as, as, um, those, and, and instead of resisting, um, you know, the, uh, the segregationist laws being put in place. Um, you know, white Christians for the most part were actually aiding and abetting them. Um, you know, we had an opportunity during the civil rights movement, uh, when people like King and James Baldwin and others were, were explicitly calling out like white Christians to stand up. Um, and I, and I think we're at another moment like that now. Um, and so at this moment of reckoning in the country, it's yet another opportunity. It's very late in the day. Um, but I think, um, there, there's a, there's a, um, a window here, um, that I'm really hoping, uh, that, that white Christians will, will really be willing to stand up and, and take a harder look. And again, you know, yes, to, uh, make things right between white Christians and our African American brothers and sisters that we have, um, you know, been a part of wronging over so many years. Um, but also for ourselves, right. That we'll finally want to rid uh, uh, our, our faith and, um, you know, our theology, our practices, and it, it's in our hymns, it's in our liturgy. Um, and we'll finally be able to, to rid, uh, these, uh, this legacy of white supremacy, you know, from, from the Christianity that we pass on to our kids and our grandchildren. And what do you think the odds are on that? Do you think, do you I, think there's a chance? I think there's a chance, you know, I, I'm actually a little more hopeful than I was when I turned in the manuscript to the book, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, so, so last fall, you know, is when I wrapped the manuscript and just, just two quick things. Like, you know, I, I, I could not have imagined my home state of Mississippi, uh, for example, um, removing the Confederate flag, you know, from its state flag. That's, mm. that's not something I would have foreseen. Um, even, even, you know, for what, uh, a year ago, um, when I was wrapping up the book and not only there, I mean, that it wasn't just the legislature, but actually before the legislature voted, the Mississippi Baptist Convention, you know, which is the, the state's arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, actually called on the governor and the legislature to do it, to, to remove it um, and, and, and kind of took us took a stand. I would not have it, I just would not have anticipated that. Um, I also spent some time in Richmond doing research for the book last summer. And when I was there, you know, I walked Monument Avenue, walked past five massive monuments to Confederate leaders, um, all of which were, um, you know, installed with great fanfare and and the support of white Christian churches, um, you know, in Richmond. Uh, and to see that within a few weeks time after um, the murder of George Floyd, uh, that four of the five of those statues that are part of the those big installations had been pulled down. Um, and the fifth one to Robert E. Lee is slated for removal um, as well. And so, you know, that's those are real symbolic changes there. And, and so I, I think that's real. I do think the key, though, is after the apologies, you know, and calling on the symbols to come down mm. again, important things. What's going to be the work of repair, restitution and responsibility? Yeah, um, that, that white Christians are willing to take up, you know, when when the dust is settled from the monuments and the apologies have stopped echoing um, what, what, what work are white Christians really willing to do. And I think that's the proof is going to be in the pudding yep. um, uh, on, on that front. 
Yeah, with criminal justice reform, you know, down yeah. in the, down in the weeds of zoning uh, policies um, in local communities, and you know, reparations and in. in you know, sometimes we talk about what form, you know, reparation should take. And I, my personal opinion is that it should take multiple forms. Like it, one, mm-hmm. one kind of reparations is certainly not enough. And um, there's nothing that could be done to pay back what, um, you know, 400 years of yeah racial violence and disinvestment and so forth. So, well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. Um, the book is White Too Long. And I hope everyone will go out and, and get it and read it. Um, if you're a Christian listening to this by some chance, um, you know, buy it for uh, buy it for your reading group at your church. Um, if you're friends with some Christians, because I think really the audience that needs to to read this is is the Christians. I mean, this is who you're writing it for, um, and the rest of us can can help along the way. We have work to do too. Um, but again, thanks, thank you, Robbie, for for being on the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you appreciated that. And I I really hope that you'll check out Robbie's work and his new book, White Too Long. I always hope you'll share the podcast episodes with your friends, but I especially hope that you'll share this one. I would really love for more Christians to hear this and read Robbie's book. Racism is perhaps the topic that generates the most defensiveness from us. So I'm under no illusions that Christians will hear this and suddenly say, oh my gosh, our faith is built on the foundation of white supremacy and we've created theological justifications for it. We've got to change. But I do hope something might lodge in folks' minds and make them a bit more skeptical of their innocence in the future. I'd love to hear from you. Please write to me at ryan at lifeaftergod.org. Let me know what you liked, where you think I messed up, or what you'd like to see me do in future episodes. To learn more about Life After God, to link up with our social media accounts, and just generally stay in touch, please visit our website at lifeaftergod.org. There you can join our email newsletter and browse the entire back catalog of our episodes, over 90 episodes now. If this podcast is meaningful to you and it's been a source of inspiration, please join the group of members and patrons who make it possible by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash lifeaftergod. The price of a cup of coffee per month goes so much further than you can imagine and grows the total base of contributors. And by doing this, more people take what we're doing seriously, I believe, and we reach a much wider audience. Thank you again for for tuning in. And seriously, drop me a line. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, my name is Ryan Bell, and this has been the Life After God podcast. 